welcome to Western Civ, episode 166, The Unknown Captain. Last time we covered the complicated history that set the stage for the religious and commercial purposes for what would become Vasco da Gama and his voyages of discovery. Europe felt it had both a commercial and religious imperative to sail around the caliphate and find a direct route to the spices. Not only would doing so make Europe richer, but this action would effectively ruin the economies of those Arab middlemen. Today, we get to see Europe, specifically Portugal, put their plan into action. In 1487, King John of Portugal was ready. After months of preparation and supplying the Italian merchant men of the Mediterranean with false information to the contrary, he was ready to sail all the way around Africa to see if the new maps were right. Perhaps Africa didn't extend forever. Maybe you could go around it. To head the expedition, King John selected Bartolomeo Diaz, a cavalier of the royal household, an experienced captain. Diaz quietly left Lisbon in August 1487. The fleet consisted of two vessels, one captained by Diaz, the other by his brother, Pedro. The fleet swept past the Congo River, only to hit a massive storm. Diaz tried to cut out to see if he could get around it, but to no avail. So Diaz decided to pull up his sails and wait it out. Once the storm abated, he sailed east. But now he could not find the land, and instead decided to turn north. Soon, his men spotted mountains in the distance, and believe it or not, humans on the shore herding animals. Exhausted and running out of food, Diaz nonetheless determined to turn back. He had sailed 1,400 miles from Lisbon. And though he didn't know it at the time that he turned back, he actually had rounded Africa. As he sailed back, he noted a dramatic set of mountains backed by high peaks that made the mountains themselves here is a kind of table. Ruefully, he named it the Cape of Storms. Upon his return, King John renamed it the Cape of Good Hope. The voyage had actually lasted more than 16 months. Technically, Diaz had done it. His voyage had proved that one could sail around Africa. Yet, technically, his mission was to find India or Priest or John. So by those accounts, Diaz failed. That being said, history would be kinder to the first European to sail around Africa. Interestingly, amongst the throng that gathered to hear Diaz's reports was none other than Christopher Columbus. By now, the Portuguese controlled the entire west coast of Africa. What more could they do with the Cape rounded? Now, before Vasco da Gama discovered, and that's in quotations, India, Columbus landed in his own India. Okay, technically the Caribbean. But remember that this event caused the Portuguese to fly into an intense panic. Suddenly, they were locked in a race for the New World and to get to India. So, on June the 7th, 1494, the two sides signed the Treaty of Tordesillas, which moved the potential line of conquest 
270 miles to the west of the Cape Verde Islands. Portugal saw this as a win because they wanted Africa. Spain got everything to the west. Portugal technically, I guess, got India. They just weren't, you know, 100% sure where it was. Now, of course, and I love this about the Treaty of Tordesillas, the whole thing was more or less pointless. Nations like England and the Netherlands had never signed it. They were certainly weren't going to follow it. Moreover, you know, sailors couldn't determine their longitude at sea regardless. So determining if somebody had violated the treaty was nigh on impossible. And no one knew whether this line merely bisected the Western Hemisphere or did it run all the way around the globe, which would have made Spain the ruler of everything, by the way, if it didn't. The Portuguese didn't care. For the time being, eh, they got what they wanted. In 1494, with the Treaty of Tordesillas signed, the Portuguese king ordered Diaz to work on two new vessels. This time, the objective was clear, India or bust. Diaz realized that the traditional caravel was simply too small for comfort. It sat too low in the water to deal with the storms that frequented the African coast. These new ships would have three sails with square rigged larger sails on the main mast and the foremast and a single lateen sail on the mizzen mast. These new ships were roughly two times the size of a traditional caravel and were built for a voyage measured in months, not weeks. These ships were also designed to return with goods. On October 25th, 1495, King John died. His son, Manuel I, was a vain and capricious man. He was terrified of rivals, and during his reign, the National Assembly met only three times. He was also profoundly religious and loved the idea of a crusade that could strike at the heart of Islam. A voyage to India, therefore, was right up his alley. Manuel was convinced that the world might end in 1500, a fact which made all the more sense to Manuel due to the fall of Constantinople in 1453. The armada that he wanted to send to India was the first prong of an assault that he imagined one day storming the very walls of Jerusalem. It was truly going to be the last crusade. Interestingly, Diaz would not lead it, in spite of the fact that he would have been the very obvious choice for King Manuel. He was not the choice. This was really because while Diaz was an excellent navigator and map maker, the whole intent of the voyage was very different from that of Columbus. The plans assumed that the crew would be away for three years, and they planned accordingly. And moreover, remember that this voyage was very much conceived as a crusade against Islam. Thus, the leader, the captain of the voyage, they had to be more than just an explorer. He had to be a sailor a diplomat, and a war leader. Even so, Vasco da Gama was such a dark horse candidate that even contemporaries struggled to explain why he got the job. There are a few potential explanations, though. It's possible that King Manuel first offered the job to Vasco da Gama's father, who died, and then his brother, who got sick before giving it to his third choice because 
For some reason, I guess this had to be a family affair. Another explanation is that King Manuel just personally really liked Bosco da Gama. Yet the most likely reason was that a three-year voyage that was 99% likely to end in death? You know, better volunteers weren't exactly beating down the king's door. In other words, Vasco da Gama, he was the best that King Manuel could get. Vasco da Gama was the son of a minor nobleman whose holdings hit the sea. Hence, he'd have some experience aboard a ship. He was the third of five sons. He previously fought against the Muslims in Al Gavre and thus had military experience. He was also a bit of a hothead. For example, one night while walking, he was stopped by a magistrate and asked for identification, which was perfectly normal. Da Gama refused and a fight broke out. Ultimately, the young men began to beat up the official until other officials arrived and saved him. This was the tenor of the man who would lead Portugal's great aquatic crusade to India. But Da Gama was ambitious. And he was willing to risk his life to potentially make a fortune. He was also unpolished. He was intelligent, yet blunt in manners. Regardless, King Manuel saw something in him that he thought would make Vasco da Gama a natural leader. Time would prove him right, though da Gama's bad habits would come back to haunt him several times on his voyages. The two newly built ships needed two captains. Vasco da Gama's first choice was his brother, Paolo, though the man had no discernible sailing experience. It's very likely that da Gama simply favored loyalty over experience. So Vasco took the larger of the two ships, the Sao Gabriel, while Paolo took the smaller Sao Rafael. Both ships were named for saints, and Sao in the Portuguese means saint. The ordinary seamen were selected from veterans of earlier voyages to Africa, including some men who did sail with Bartolomeu Dias around the Cape. These were experienced and highly skilled men. There were carpenters, caulkers, coopers, rope makers, gunners, soldiers, page boys, servants, and slaves. But apart from the slaves, there were no foreigners given the mission's strategic importance to Portugal, and obviously there were no women. Before leaving, King Manuel gathered de Gama and his entire crew together and entreated them to treat the entire voyage as a new crusade, saying, quote, I have decided that nothing is more fitting for my kingdom, as I have often debated with you, than to search for India and the lands of the East. In those places, though they are far from the Church of Rome, I hope with God's mercy that not only may the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, his Son, be proclaimed and adopted through our efforts, and that we may win fame and praise among men as our reward, but also that we will wrest new kingdoms, states, and great wealth by force of arms from the hands of the infidel. End quote. The Gama was going to sail around Africa with the best men Portugal could provide and the best intelligence to. Generations of Portuguese sailors, explorers, and map makers had accumulated a wealth of knowledge about the West African coast. De Gama was now privy to it all. Finally, on Saturday, July 8th, 1497, De Gama was ready and departed Portugal with the following prayer. Quote, May God our Lord permit us to accomplish this voyage in his service. 
Amen. Everything went smoothly at first. By July 15th, the two ships were cruising into the Canary Islands. Da Gama briefly lost sight of his brother's ship, but that was a normal occurrence on the sea, and something that the Portuguese were now very used to. Da Gama made for the Cape Verde Islands, and after a week, the ships once more sighted each other before turning south again. For four days, the winds died and the ships drifted listlessly. But then on July 26th, the wind picked up again, and the ships continued on their way. From there, they stopped at Santiago, the largest of the Cape Verde Islands, and stayed a week, making necessary repairs to the rigging and taking on fresh supplies. On August the 3rd, the ships were once more sailing for Africa, but now had reached the doldrums, a space of water where winds die and ships can find themselves trapped for days or even weeks. Da Gama's men found no such stillness, but instead the ships were pounded with squalls until they had to turn southwest and sail out toward the very center of the Atlantic. Now, on all previous expeditions, including those by Bartolomeu Diaz, the Portuguese had always hugged the coast but the experience had taught the Portuguese that their larger square-rigged vessels did not do as well there as they could not tack effectively. As a result, De Gama now wheeled out into the ocean to catch the larger winds that would then, in a semicircle, push him back to the southern tip of Africa. There remains debate today over whether De Gama did this on purpose or it was just a happy accident. If it was the latter, then De Gama was truly fortunate indeed. Regardless, his men had little choice but to trust their commander. Each day on board began with prayers and hymns, this again being a holy crusade. From there, it was time for the daily work of sailing a ship. Water was pumped out of bilges, the deck was swabbed, rigging and sails were repaired. The gunners would even conduct some target practice, though those not participating were advised to keep their distance, as James II of Scotland learned in 1460. Quote, and while this prince more curious than became him, or the majesty of a king, did stand near hand the gunners when the artillery was discharged, his thigh bone was dug in two with a piece of misfragmented gun that broke in the shooting by which he was stricken to the ground and died hastily, end quote. While all this was going on, the pilots calculated their position and continuously corrected their course. This was not easy. As the ship moved south and the pole star declined, it was harder to determine their latitude. They could try to use an astrolab and check the angle of the same star, assuming they could see it. The pilots would then be able to use the angle from the astrolab and the chart attached to the mechanism to more precisely determine their latitude, therefore their position. Now, the Portuguese were the first Europeans who had to confront the problem of determining latitude in the southern hemisphere. See, below the equator, you cannot see the pole star. So what they did was to use the altitude of the sun at noon to determine their position. This was an almost impossible task. The pilots would need to squint at the sun multiple times around noon to get readings, accurate clocks not being made available at sea. Moreover, the sun doesn't follow the celestial equator, which made readings more difficult. And an experienced Portuguese sailor knew that he had to compensate for the difference. Da Gama had the best technology available for 1497, the rule of the sun. The rule of the sun was a system of tables and mathematical equations drawn up back in 1488. The idea behind the table 
was to check the declination of the sun from noon on and use the angles to figure latitude. It was extremely laborious, and many sailors preferred to just sail by their gut. But da Gama was a stickler for the rules and insisted that the crew use the formulas. Now beyond all this, remember that there was no way at all to figure longitude. Navigators had to make informed guesses about their longitude, given the compass and their best estimates about speed. And that compass, well, generally what we mean by a compass was really nothing more than a magnetized needle set to pivot in a round bowl marked with the directionals. An officer would stand and watch the needle move and then shout instructions to the helmsman who would move the heavy tiller. Again, literally none of this was easy. September passed into October with few distractions, and the ship sailed on. By now, the ships had wheeled south as far as they would go, and the trade winds were blowing them back to Africa. On November the 1st, the crew sighted Gulfweed, a telltale sign that land was near. They lowered the lead line to check their depth, and found that a ship was at a mere 110 fathoms, 660 feet. By this gauge, the crew guessed they were about 100 miles from the Cape of Good Hope. At nine in the morning, the crew sighted land, and everyone stopped, and this is true, to put on their best clothes. I guess they assumed they were going for a fancy dinner. I suppose they deserved it. They had now been at sea for 33 days and were beginning to run short on water. But the crucial point is this. Da Gama's plan had actually worked. In reality, sweeping out into the Atlantic Ocean and then wheeling west shaved weeks off of their voyage. It would prove to be the gold standard route for rounding Africa for over a century. The ships moved toward the coast, and this time they found themselves in front of a wide bay backed by low-lying plains. Diaz's veterans on board had not seen it before and named it St. Helens Bay. Da Gama sent a boat to the shore to determine if they could land. They could, and the ships dropped anchor on November the 8th. One by one, the crews pulled the ships into the shallows, and the process of careening began. Four months at sea had already badly damaged parts of both ships. After pulling the ship over on its side, the sailors scraped away the accumulated barnacles. Then they scrubbed off the worms, snails, and weeds and drove fresh oakum into the seams. Then the process was repeated for the other side and then the other ship. Then each ship needed its very disgusting ballast emptied and replaced with fresh water. Just take my word for it. I won't read the description of the ballast water for those eating or making dinner, but... After four months, the bilge water below deck was super gross. But they needed ballast, because remember, these larger ships were supposed to return full of spices. Now, as all this was going on, a search party was reconnoitering the shore. A few miles in, they found a river, and there they stumbled upon some people. A day later, da Gama himself went ashore to take more accurate astrolab readings, since such was much easier on the shore. His men, meanwhile, crept up on a group of native men, surprised them, seized one, and manhandled him back to the coast to see the Gama. Overall, and I suppose an interesting theory on how one might start international relations. Now, the man was clearly terrified, but they dragged him before da Gama nonetheless. Sitting him next to two ship's boys, one of which was a black enslaved young man, the man began to calm down and even eat with the others. Da Gama then loaded the man down with clothing and a few trinkets and set him free. Soon, as Da Gama hoped, he reappeared on the shore with a group of men. Da Gama then laid out samples of cinnamon, cloves, and gold, and through gestures asked if they had anything like this to trade. When it became clear that they did not, Da Gama gave them some more trinkets for their time and sent them on their way. More locals arrived the next day, 
and some of the men traded for small things like conch shells. But other than that, little came of this first meeting between the residents of South Africa and the Europeans. On November 16th, at first light, de Gama left the bay and sailed to the southwest. Two days later, they caught a glimpse of the Cape of Good Hope, its mountains glowing in the setting sun. But the Cape proved much more fun to look at than to pass. The winds howled, and for four days, de Gama tried to sail around it, only to be blown back to shore each time. Finally, on November 22nd, the winds shifted, and they passed the Cape. For three days afterwards, the ships hugged the coast until they reached an enormous bay, six leagues deep and six leagues wide at its mouth. Oddly, de Gama saw no one. As he looked around, he saw a perfect harbor, but it was pristine in its natural beauty, with nary a person to be seen. De Gama allowed his men to stop again in the bay and rest. There they completed some necessary repairs and erected both a cross and a wooden pillar bearing the Portuguese flag and the papal banner. After 13 days of recuperating in the bay, the fleet set sail. Only then, as the ships were departing, did the men on the deck see the Africans finally emerge from the bush and smash both the cross and the flags to pieces. So, I guess South Africa was not claimed in the name of the King of Portugal? Not sure how that works. The date was now December 7th, and the mood on the ship was one of cautious excitement. Bartolomeu Dias had only made it a little further on his voyage, and everyone wondered if they could now pass the point on the map that presently showed blank. Then the wind dropped. For a whole day, the ships languished off the coast of South Africa. On December the 8th, the wind picked up again, allowing the fleet to sail straight into a storm. What the fleet went through next must have been terrifying. The waves roared and drove the ships into the cliffs and tossed them back and forth. Water crashed on the decks, and there off the coast of South Africa, the water is freezing cold. Even with several men struggling with the tiller, they could barely move the rudder. The ships lost sight of one another, and aboard de Gama's flagship, the men formed up behind a cross, beseeching an obviously angry god to save them. Finally, around sunset, the skies lightened, and the two ships could once more see each other. The fleet had been blown far out to sea. Three days later, as the ship sailed east, which was, frankly, just the direction the wind was taking them, the men sighted a small group of islands. A bit further on, they saw a headland and the very pillar that Bartholomew Diaz erected on his voyage. It was December 16th, 1497, and Vasco da Gama was about to pass into history and uncharted territory. Sadly, the next day, a contrary wind drove the ships back nearly halfway to the bay that they last stopped in. Many aboard the ships felt that they must have hit some sort of mystical, invisible wall and could go no further. De Gama wasn't having it. He ordered the crews to sail east. Here, De Gama got lucky, and the ships caught a strong easterly breeze, which drove them past the furthest point Diaz reached, and up the coast. That's right, up the coast. For the first time, the African coast began trending to the northeast. They had done it. After decades of trying, Vasco da Gama's expedition became the first Europeans to sail into the Indian Ocean. If you've enjoyed the show and would like to help us out, please feel free to leave a rating or review on whatever podcast service you're listening to this. If you'd like more content, there's more available at our website, westernsibpodcast.com, link in the show notes. And for those who really want to support the show, and I do thank each and every one of you, 
for a couple of shekels a month, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash Western Civ Podcast. Not only is it instrumental in supporting the show, but you'll also get hours upon hours of bonus content, deep dives, author interviews, and so much more. Link in the show notes if you're interested. Until next time, when we go further up the coast. <laughs>